Hi. <clears throat> I think that we are live, which is great. Uh, first time I managed to get live on um, LinkedIn. This is really cool. We are live, which is great. Uh, first time I managed to get... Oh yeah, I can even see myself on the on the top of my my LinkedIn page. It's really wonderful. Okay. So I suggest we get going. Yes, and I can see that there are ooh, four people who are following. How's that possible? Because nobody knew. <laughs> nobody knew about anything. Um, good, good. Okay, so I shall start now. Um, I'm, I'm not really, you know, up to date on this technology. Like, I, I really try to do it, to make it work, this uh, live streaming on the, on LinkedIn as opposed to, um, to um, YouTube, but, but uh, it's, it's quite difficult uh, to set up really with just the instructions from LinkedIn. LinkedIn, you need to improve your, your, your way to do uh, live streaming um, through Zoom. Okay, so <clears throat> today we are here to talk about the legal case, which is called University of Massachusetts versus L'Oréal, the French cosmetic behemoth L'Oréal. It's a, a, a very weird patent infringement case, uh, which is at the moment turning into a, a, a PR disaster for uh, the global firm L'Oréal. And I wanted to um, come back to this interesting and um, <clears throat> insightful case with you today. So we released a, uh, an article last week uh, on uh, our websites, crefovi.com and crefovi.fr. And um, should you decide to subscribe to our subscription plans or which come with a one day free trial for you to familiarize yourself with our um, restricted content, uh, then you, uh, you can actually read the um, the written version of this uh, of this take of our take on the uh, Ma University of Massachusetts versus L'Oréal case. So, what are the facts in this legal saga, which has been going on for almost twenty years? Well, in uh, <clears throat> July two thousand and twenty-two, the United States Patent and Trademark Office, called the USPTO, issued a um, U.S. patent number called 6423327, entitled Treatment of Skin with Adenosine or Adenosine Analog. Okay, so the USPTO issued a first patent, patent 327, to the inventors James G. Thompson and Michael F. Etier. Um, these inventors, Thompson and Etier, are actually, were at the time, back in 2020, 2002, uh, uh, tenured professors uh, uh, and at the University of Massachusetts, and um, yeah, so public institution of higher education in Massachusetts, and so the um, University of Massachusetts is the assignee in this uh, in this um, patent three two seven, with uh, Dobson and Etier, the inventors, being the assignors and the University of Massachusetts being the assignee. So this patent 327 was then completed by an additional patent, which was filed in November 2003, again by the same individuals, the same inventors, Ms. Mr. Dobson and ETA. And again, in this second patent entitled Treatment of Skin with Adenosine or Adenosine Analog, so exactly the same title and uh, patent 327. Um, so in this patent 513, the second patent, again, the University of Massachusetts was also the assignee listed on this patent 513. So as I just mentioned, the patents 327 and um, 513 shared the same title. 
as well as the same abstract, the same inventors, the same specification, the same assignee, and also even some of their claims were similar. Indeed, it claims one and nine of the patents of the two patents are identical, except from the claimed concentration of adenosine applied to the dermal cells. So specifically, patent 327 claims an adenosine concentration of 10.4 M to 10.7 M, while patent 513 claims a concentration of 10.3 uh, M to 10.7 M. So what, what are those two patents about? Well, they are about the fact that Mr. Dobson and Mr. Etier have had invented um, a use of this uh, 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 adenosine product and adenosine analog to, on the skin in order to regenerate the, the, the cells, the skin cells, and to make your skin, in particular face skin, uh, feel uh, better and regenerate faster. Um, and so in uh, um, 2003, 2004, they um, decided to uh, <clears throat> assign to to sorry to license to license uh, these uh, these two patents to a licensee which is the US uh, Massachusetts based religious company called Theresian Carmelites Inc okay which describes itself as a non-profit Christian monastery dedicated to prayer contemplation and service to the poor and marginalized so the um, uh, Theresian, Theresian Carmelites company was fronted and managed by a, uh, a man who was a monk in this um, uh, Catholic order at the time called Denis Wierzlowski, a uh, self-described former monk because then he actually left his <laughs> Uh, is, is, is a status of, of being a monk for the uh, Catholic order, the Carmelites. And so he, now he describes himself as being a former monk to an investor, spiritual entrepreneur, your guide, educator. And he seemed to have led a pretty tough life. Uh, apparently, Mr. Wierzowski uh, joined the um, Theresian Carmelites when he was 13 years old only. So it's a, um, a, a seclusive order of a Catholic faith. And he alleges that uh, from 13 up until his um, uh, early 20s, he was actually uh, sexually assaulted by two members of the Theresian Carmelites order. Nonetheless, he decided to stay in this order. And actually, he um, climbed through the ranks and, um, and um, started to actually lead this order. Um, so yes, the Carmelites actually um, do value the uh, strict, strict values of being a hermit and monastic um, order. And uh, it's, it's, it's a Roman Catholic mendicant religious order. Um, so, <clears throat> so this is actually the licensee uh, of, of uh, um, the University of Massachusetts in relation to those two patents that I've just mentioned, 327 and 513. I mean, it seems a little bit weird, but my understanding further to doing quite a lot of research is that Mr. Dobson, one of the inventors, was actually a, a good friend of uh, the Carmelites, and in particular of uh, uh, father, uh, sorry, brother, uh, we're and so that's why he decided probably out of you know um as a like kind of almost donation to um have the this Carmelite order becoming the licensee of those two patents so what the Theresian Carmelites Inc company managed by uh, this um uh, Carmelite order did was that they actually set up a a, a, a a legal entity called Carmelite Laboratories LLC, Carmel Carme Laboratories LLC, a wholly owned for profit subsidiary of uh, uh, Theresian Carmelites, which was actually the uh, legal entity to which the two licenses, 327 and 516, were licensed. And, and then they went on to um, uh, the Carmelite laboratories and this, uh, this uh, Carmelite order went on to, to, to start creating some, um, some uh, cosmetic products uh, which, which um, were basically making the most of the inventions set out in the two patents. 
Um, and um, <clears throat> apparently it was not a success. Uh, and this Carmelite Laboratories LLC company was uh, dissolved by court order in June, 2021. So what happened? I mean, how come this was not a success and it failed, etc. what happened? Well, in August, 2017, the University of Massachusetts i.e. the assignee of these two patents, and Carmelite Labora Carmel Laboratories, the licensee, uh, filed a complaint with the uh, court in Massachusetts, claiming that the, um, the two patents had been infringed by L'Oréal, the L'Oréal SA, the French headquartered um, cosmetic giant L'Oréal SA, as well as its American, um, American wholly owned subsidiary, L'Oréal USA. And yeah, so using the patented adenosine technology, Carmelite, Carmel Laboratories allegedly developed Isamine, an anti-aging face cream that it released for sale in 2009. Uh, but as I said, it was not uh, a success and uh, Carmel uh, Laboratories actually uh, ended up being uh, wound up in, uh, in 20, 20, 2021. And so uh, the, the uh, lawsuit filed by uh, the claimants, University of Massachusetts and Carmel Laboratories against L'Oréal SA and uh, L'Oréal USA was, uh, was uh, filed with the US District Court in Delaware because L'Oréal USA is a Delaware incorporated company. So in the complaint filed in, uh, in um, 2017, the two claimants allege that um, L'Oréal SA and L'Oréal USA, which from now on we're going to call the defendants together, the defendants used the technology patented under the patents without having secured any license or assignment of rights from the claimants. And the defendants had been aware of the claimants' adenosine technology and the patents since at least 20, 2002, sorry, as evidenced by the numerous references to the patents set out in the defendants' failed US patent application entitled Method for Softening Lines and Relaxing the Skin with Adenosine and Adenosine Analogs, which was rejected. So, um, and then, so, so the defendants actually made references to the two patents, 327 and 516, in the uh, attempted uh, patent application with U the USPTO. The USPTO actually rejected such, uh, such patents which referred to the adenosine invention, which did not belong to them. And so still in the continuing reading the complaint, the claimants allege that in fall of 2003, an agent of the two defendants con contacted Mr. Dobson, one of the two inventors of the patents, to discuss the patents, but failed to secure a license to the patents from him. Well, of course, because he had actually licensed the patents to with the University of Massachusetts to with Wierysowski and, uh, and his Carmelite order through Carmel Laboratories. Nonetheless, after speaking with Mr. Dobson, the inventor, and in full knowledge of the technology exclusively licensed to Carmel Laboratories, the defendants began creating, marketing, and selling cosmetic products using the patented adenosine technology, in particular for L'Oréal brands Biotherm, The Body Shop, Carita, Decléor, Garnier, Giorgio Armani, Elena Rubinstein, Kiehl's, L'Oréal Paris, La Roche-Posay, Lancôme, Maybelline, Roger Gallet, Chou Uemera, Vichy, and Yves Saint Laurent, together the accused adenosine products. So in almost all the creams and products and cosmetics that they were releasing, the claimants alleged that um, the defendants, L'Oréal, were actually using the adenosine patent and technology. So such accused adenosine products are sold in particular in Delaware by L'Oréal USA, so therefore, the Delaware, Delaware uh, District Court is competent, say the two claimants. And due to public focus on the accused adenosine products, projected sale of the Carmel Laboratories it, uh, cream, easy mean, did not materialize, resulting in lost revenues to Carmel Laboratories and, and ultimately to um, um, 
to the older Teresian Carmelites. <clears throat> and Teresian Carmelites plummeting funds left it unable to pay the monastery's mortgage and to lapse payments on obligations it undertook to finance the launch of Isamine, the cream. Teresian Carmelites was forced to sell off certain properties it owned to prevent foreclosure on the monastery and was unable to maintain health insurance for its members. The monastery was unable to use the projected Isamine profits to fund its charitable works. And in March 2015, Mr. Wierizowski, president of Teresian Carmelites and Carmel Laboratories, sent a letter to Jean-Paul Argon, CEO of L'Oréal, stating his belief that the accused adenosine products infringe the patents and affirming that Carmel Laboratories is the exclusive licensee of the patents, but no out-of-court settlement was reached by the claimants and the defendants. So in the complaint, it is set out that the claimants sue the defendants for infringement of patent 327, infringement of patent 513, willful and deliberate infringement of the patents, in, and titling the claimants to increase damages and to attorney's fees and costs incurred in prosecuting the action, as well as pre-judgment and post-judgment interest, and a permanent injunction on joining the defendants from further infringing the patents. So these are the facts, okay? And as you can see, it's a, a pretty full-on patent infringement lawsuit here, which, uh, which was filed by the claimants for their complaint in, uh, in um, August 2017. And now I'm asking, why has the lawsuit been dragging on for around six years now? Because despite the fact that a, um, <clears throat> a court of appeal judgment was uh, handed down uh, in June 2022 this year, um, we there's been almost no <laughs> Track no headway made on the um, on the uh, judgment phase of this uh, of this case. What so? What is the procedural history of this long winding case? Well, <clears throat> as mentioned above, the claimants filed their legal action against the defendant on in, in June two thousand seventeen asserting causes of action for the alleged infringements of the patent. And in on the 4th of August 2017, L'Oréal USA filed a motion to dismiss the claimant's original complaint. So subsequently, the claimants filed the, com the complaint on the 18th of August 2017, the complaint I've just summarized the uh, content of for you just uh, a few minutes ago. And in response, L'Oréal USA filed a motion to dismiss the complaint on the 23rd of August 2017, alleging that the causes of action failed to state a claim. L'Oréal followed suit on the 16th of October 2017, filing a motion to dismiss for lack of personal jurisdiction and failure to state a claim upon which relief can be granted. The U.S. District Court for the District of Delaware, in just in its just judgment handed down by Sherry Fallon, U.S. Magistrate Judge, on 13th of November 2018, decided to deny all of L'Oreal's and L'Oreal's U.S.'s motions to dismiss the claimant's causes of action for direct infringement of the patents, induced infringement of the patents, contributory infringement of the patents, and welfare infringement of the patents. Um, instead, finding that the claimants had properly pled willful infringement, knowledge, willful, willfulness and intent in the complaint, as well as um, um, uh, being able to demonstrate that there was uh, induced infringement and um, also direct infringement in the complaint. Uh, but the judge, Judge uh, Fallon, did grant L'Oréal's motion to dismiss the claimant's cause of action for lack of personal jurisdiction of the Delaware court of a French company L'Oréal without permitting the claimants to conduct jurisdictional discovery. So as a result of this decision, this judgment uh, handed down in November 2018 by the um, US District Court for the District of Delaware, the legal the lawsuit was uh, then refocused only on L'Oréal USA. L'Oréal SA, the French company, was opted out of the proceedings um, in view of the, of, the, of the judgment. 
so with a claim then proceeding only against L'Oréal USA, the district court ruled on a, on a dispute about the proper construction of one limitation of a claim that is representative for present purposes. And relying on the construction, the district court subsequently held another limitation of a claim indefinite. On that basis, the court entered into a final judgment of invalidity of the asserted claims against the claimants. So to summarize and to go straight to the point, what happened is that L'Oréal USA and its massive legal team, you know, played the clock and just went on uh, basically opposing some futile uh, procedural uh, arguments against the claimants in order to stop their claims. And for some reason, which frankly I don't really understand, to be honest, the judge uh, from the uh, court of Delaware seemed to have acquiesced to this uh, delaying tactics. And in, 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 in the end, just um, entered into a final judgment of, of invalidity of the asserted claims against the claimants. So that's not great because it means that the, uh, the, 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 the core of a, of, a, of a legal dispute at this moment was never um, looked at properly by a judge and therefore the dispute is still on, but for some stupid and futile procedural um, oppositions raised by L'Oréal, in particular L'Oréal USA, this whole case had been stopped up to now. So what happened in a sort of complete reversal of this um, collision course on which the claimants seem to be is that on the 13th of June, 2022, so this year, around two months ago, US Chief Judge Colm Connolly handed down another judgment, this time from the US Court of Appeals for the Federal Circuit, which decided to reject the district court's claim construction on which the indefiniteness ruling depends as understood by both parties on appeal. And this judgment from the Court of Appeal vacated the indefiniteness ruling because the claim construction was rejected, remanded for further proceedings, Finally, therefore, it's going to be going to, you know, the, the proper phase of a, tr a judgment trial. And then it concluded that the claimants were entitled to just jurisdiction or discovery, and it vacated the dismissal of the French company L'Oréal SA. So <clears throat> that was uh, quite, a, you know, a, uh, like a very different um, outcome. Um, than the one that L'Oréal probably expected, but it seems to be a much more equitable outcome uh, further to the claimants, of course, appealing the, uh, the, the judgment that had been handed down by the, um, the US uh, District Court for the, the District of Delaware. And so <clears throat> here we are. L'Oréal now has to face the consequences of its acts, potentially uh, patent infringement acts and um, and um, actions, and, and it will have to go through the whole jurisdictional discovery process. And in the US, discovery phase is extremely time consuming, very expensive, also very wide ranging, which means that uh, L'Oréal may have to disclose a lot of confidential information, know-how, et cetera, et cetera, in, to the court as well as to the claimants in order to be able to fulfill its obligations under this um, uh, jurisdictional discovery uh, uh, process. So <clears throat> this is why it's been taking on six years since the claim had been filed in uh, August, 2017, uh, because as I said, uh, L'Oréal played the clock and used some uh, dilatory tactics and futile tactics in order to derail the claims uh, raised by the claimant. However, with this uh, Court of Appeal judgment handed down in June 2022, the case is now firmly back on track and L'Oréal faces an absolute PR, legal and financial disaster. So what are the takeaways from this lawsuit for L'Oréal from a PR standpoint, competition law standpoint and intellectual property law standpoint? Well, uh, really, when when I analyzed this case and um, and then came the moment where I had to actually give my analysis of it, I was like, "What on earth was is L'Oréal thinking? How could they even possibly think that they could win on this? It's just so blatant. But the patent, even the patent infringement acts, seem you know pretty blatant." 
Um, of course, we are not at the phase where uh, various statements have been, uh, you know, um, shared by the parties and the evidence has been actually put forward um, to, to, be, to be assessed by the, by the judge. But nonetheless, I mean, it seems to be pretty blatant that the adenosine technology was uh, uh, first invented by uh, these two guys from the University of Massachusetts, um, Dobson and e Etier. And, and it, 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 for sure, L'Oréal definitely doesn't have a license to this, to this uh, uh, patented technology. So it is quite obvious that L'Oréal has played the card of the Titan against the midget so far, ignoring the claimant's cease and desist letter, which was sent in um, uh, by uh, the uh, by Wierzyszowski, the brother and president of um, um, Theresian Carmelites and the Carmel Laboratories in March 2015. They completely ignored the letter, uh, which asked them to cease and desist from using that patent technology in all their, uh, their brands. And also um, L'Oréal completely waved away any attempt to settle this uh, dispute out of court. So, um, and then L'Oréal proceeded on to using some delaying tactics as well as bullying strategies to dismiss the case again and again for futile reasons, such as you know, invoking the lack of personal jurisdiction, the claim construction, the indefiniteness, and all these tactics worked with first degree court, of court and judge, but were then rejected by the more enlightened and grounded appeals judge when the two claimants appealed. Which is a good thing because the law is here to actually um, hand down judgments which are in, you know, equitable, and um, it is indeed in this situation equitable that the claimants have a, um, the claims um, uh, properly and fully investigated by the court, so that uh, a judgment in full view and uh, and, uh, and knowledge of all the uh, evidence and facts can be handed down by uh, by the court. But um, in the meantime, while muddying the waters, L'Oréal attempted to diverge everyone's attention from the real legal issue at stake here, which is that it is very plausible that L'Oréal have violently, willfully, and repeatedly breached the patents, as well as all the contractual and intellectual property rights of the claimants. So since such breaches have been going on for around 10 years, with the sales of the accused adenosine products by L'Oréal around the world, the amount of damages due to the claimants may reach stratospherical heights. Instead of ignoring for so many years the claims, which seem to be well-founded from the claimants, they've been keeping on using this aden adenosine patented technology and um, selling products with adenosine all over the world through at least 10 to 20 of their brands, and now, when, it's going, when the time is going to come to assess the damages, that is going to be very, very costly for L'Oréal. And they will have to provide all the figures um, through the discovery process that I mentioned before, which cannot be breached um, in US courts. Yeah, so since the appeal judgment confirmed that the claimants are entitled to jurisdictional discovery, as I was saying, L'Oréal is now going to be constrained to disclose all confidential documents, data, know-how requested by the claimants to the claimants and the courts within the course of the discovery process, irrespective of the fact that L'Oréal is a French company and that both French and the US, France and the USA are parties to the Hague Convention of 18 of March 1970, which sets out provisions for the communication of evidence in the scope of foreign court proceedings. So even L'Oréal, which now is back in the case, yeah, the um, uh, judge from the Court of Appeal has, has said that L'Oréal SA, the French company, needs to be uh, encompassed in the, uh, in the lawsuit as it was initially with L'Oréal USA, so now L'Oréal USA plus SA have to comply with the discovery process, even though L'Oréal SA is a French company because, um, because they have to uh, in compliance with the, um, the Hague Convention of 18th of March, 1970. And so that is going to be very onerous on uh, L'Oréal because of course, L'Oréal doesn't really want to uh, share any of its secrets, which are going to come out in the open uh, during the uh, the tr trial phase of this uh, of this um, of this lawsuit, so in a few words, L'Oréal is screwed. Its only plausible and sensible option, 
at this juncture is to settle with the claimants in order to do some damage control and attempt to preserve the remainder of its reputation as well as its wallet, because um, even if it settles, it's probably going to cost, cost it less than if it were to actually go to full trial mode. So such settlement must be confidential, of course, for L'Oréal to mitigate this PR disaster and alleviate its image as a vulture and bully, which has no qualms in squeezing to death a then Roman Catholic group focusing on supporting the poor and most fragile members of society in order to sell even more liters of creams and potions to unsuspicious members of the public. Um, indeed, something I uh, forgot to mention is that um, uh, Teresian Carmelites, the non-profit company, um, which then created this wholly uh, owned uh, for-profit uh, legal entity, Carmel Laboratories. So Teresian Carmelites' um, uh, focus is on, uh, on um, uh, supporting a, a, a the poor and most fragile members of society, in particular um, drug addicts and uh, um, people who come out of prisons, out of jail, uh, and this, this sort of uh, people who are fragile indeed. So it is obvious that the claimants are open to discussions in order to license the patents to L'Oréal, even more so now that Carmel Laboratories has been wound up on the grounds of bankruptcy in June 2021, and that Terrasian Carmelite is facing extreme serious financial difficulties after the debacle of the launch of a Isimin cosmetic products. However, it, obviously, it is up to L'Oréal to make a serious offer by offering the right price to buy the possibly permanent and irreversible rights to the patents, as well as the silence of the claimants via a confidential and preferably out of court settlement agreement. So, yeah, it seems really that this is the only viable option for L'Oréal at this juncture. And I really do think that it's uh, in-house legal team as well as private practice um, uh, councils will definitely not want this to proceed to the trial phase of this, uh, of this lawsuit. So yeah, I wish good luck to Yannick Charmé, the Group General Counsel of L'Oréal. Um, it seems that so far he and his team have not put in place the most appropriate strategy to deal with this uh, with this legal case but hey it's never too far to uh, never too late to actually right or wrong and stop acting like a bully and um, and um, um, settle this matter out of course as soon as possible and in a confidential manner so that's it for me now on this manner on this matter sorry so I see that six people are following us on the live stream. So if you have any questions, do, uh, uh, do ask them if you want. I, as I said, this is the first time that I'm live streaming on, um, on uh, um, LinkedIn. I'm really delighted that I've managed to do it, but um, uh, um, I'm not sure exactly how you can... Uh, you can ask some questions. Um, yeah. Well, um, let me see whether there are any questions on Zoom. No, I am not seeing any questions on Zoom. So, since I'm not seeing any questions on this matter of on Zoom and on uh, and on on. Uh, uh, LinkedIn. I am going to bid my farewell to you and I see you soon. Bye.